All right, my name is Eric Strzok. I'm uh, with Workers' World Party here in Chicago. I want to welcome everybody. Thanks so much to everybody that turned out. Uh, I'm actually pretty impressed that we kind of filled out everything that we had set up over here. Uh, this is going to be an educational meeting, a teach-in about against uh, fascism and against NATO expansion in Ukraine. What are fascists doing at the door right out front? And I want to especially thank the very large organized security that is here in order to allow this meeting to continue. Now, why would they feel so threatened that they have to mobilize and come here to downtown Chicago to a union hall to have a demonstration against an anti-war meeting? Because their tactics are no different than what is going on in the Ukraine. And many of the forces in the Ukraine, the fascist organizations who are racist and anti-Semitic to the core, really were held, financed, kept alive by U.S. imperialism for decades. Excuse me. Sorry to interrupt. I have one question. Is anybody here that needs to go outside? No, we're fine. We're fine. Okay. We're all okay. Thank you very much. Continue. Okay. It's often mentioned by uh, apologists for Svoboda um, that uh, Bandera, oh Bandera, no, he wasn't a Nazi. He was against the Nazis. He was thrown into a concentration camp. Yeah, he was. He was because 10 days after the German invasion, less than 10 days, eight days after the German invasion of the Soviet Union, June 30th, 1941, Bandera proclaims independent Ukraine. Not exactly what the Reich's Chancellor wanted to hear. So Bandera was taken and sent to a Sachsenhausen concentration camp. Now that sounds horrible. Well, there were concentration camps and then there were concentration camps. And the Nazis had facilities for, let's say, VIP prisoners, uh, high profile prisoners, that it wouldn't quite do to butcher. Uh, immediately, included members of European royalty. Bandera was among them. Well, whatever the contradictions may have been, Bandera was released in 1943 and continued the leadership of the uh, uh, Ukrainian insurgent army, which, like the SS volunteers, was used in anti-partisan uh, activity. Where did these people go? Uh, well, some of them come to the United States. Some of them come to our fair city. Uh, where uh, I remember throughout the 1970s, every once in a while, a Ukrainian fascist was pulled out of Chicago uh, and accused of war crimes. Um, but in 1991, with the fall of the Eastern Bloc, the fall of the, uh, of the Soviet Union, something really remarkable happens. All these fascist groups return. The Arrow Cross in Hungary, they're back. The Ustasha in Croatia, they're back. The Chetniks in, in, in Serbia, they're back. The uh, Iron Guard in Romania, there they are. Well, you're either left with one of two things. Either they hibernated for 30 years, or they were maintained. In 1991, the Social National Party of the Ukraine. At this point, I should do what my old professors used to do. The Social National <laughs> Party of the Ukraine is formed. It adopted, it was an openly fascist organization with paramilitary uniforms, etc., etc. It adopted the Wolfschangel, which is an SS rune, which you've seen on the slides earlier, an N with a bar through the middle. Um, now, I could go on, but I'll end with this. So, uh, 1991, the Social National Party, an openly neo-fascist organization, is founded in the Ukraine in the year 2004 the Social National Party changes its name to the All-Ukrainian Union, Svoboda. Because they're not an accident. U.S. imperialism needs these kinds of thugs and totally racist scum, and that is what exactly they are, in order to carry out a program of world domination. It's done through the gun, it's done through huge amounts of money, as Victoria Nolan, Assistant Secretary of State, bragged more than $5 billion had been put into the Ukraine in building up this opposition movement. At the time of the October 
what was called at the time of, of the Orange Revolution in the Ukraine in 2004, 2006. At that time, the U.S. bragged that they were maintaining 40,000 NGOs in the Ukraine. 40,000. That is a huge number of folks who are on staff, who are supposedly civil society and democratic forces. And really, there are forces organizing a coup, as they did with the Orange Revolution, and as they've done even more so with the coup that took place in late February in Kiev. This is a force that even by U.S. estimates has the support of about 5% of the population of the Ukraine. They don't want it put to any vote. Overwhelmingly, the people of the Ukraine are against joining NATO and against aligning with the UE. So they don't want that put to a vote either. So it happens through a coup. And it's not much different than what happened in the breakup of Yugoslavia. The very same tactics used of sanctions imposed to create enormous economic dislocation, of organizing mercenary bands, of bringing back forces that were maintained in, in exile for years. In Yugoslavia, it was the Ustasis who seized the government in Croatia, declared independence, were immediately recognized by the German and U.S. imperialists. And that was the first step in the breakup of Yugoslavia. It led to a really bloody civil war where more than 200,000 Serbs were expelled from Croatia by, as we saw in, in uh, Kiev, when the fascists seized power, what was the first thing they said? They did away with the autonomy of Crimea, and the next thing was they were going to do away with Russian as a second language. Now, that's what the Ustasis did in Croatia. They said, everyone who's Serbian, who has a government job, you're fired. If you have housing, you're out of it. If you have a farm, we're expropriating it. If you have a pension, it's gone. That all happened by fiat, by law, because a fascist organization was, had seized hold of the government. And the resistance led to a very deep civil war. And then it was NATO bombers who came in to Bosnia in 1994. And again, in 1999, with the bombing, 78 days. I want to say I was in Belgrade at that time where we visited hospitals, schools that were destroyed, electrical grid, bridges that were destroyed. At the end of the war, by NATO's own count, 428 schools had been bombed and 14 tanks. It was never a military war. It was an effort to absolutely destroy everything that had been built up that still existed under socialist or any kind of collective ownership arrangement was just destroyed. That meant petrochemical factories, it meant communication, it meant the electrical grid, it meant water and sanitation and sewage, it meant the schools and the hospitals. So that is U.S. tactics. And it operates politically with sustaining, and as they've done in Syria, and they did the same thing in Libya, where for decades, the Libyan royal family was maintained, along with a whole series of mercenary thugs and camps in Egypt who were brought back at the time of the, quote, Libyan uprising. The same tactics were used in Syria, the exact same tactics, where there are now mercenaries from about 60 different countries operating in Syria who have laid waste. A third of the population today of Syria is homeless in this civil war, dislocated, refugees, a country that was the most modern in the Arab world with full literacy and full free health care, destroyed. We know what the U.S. did in Iraq. We really have to look at this is the center of an empire. And unless we start with that understanding, more than 100 countries around the world, I think it's 130 countries around the world, there are U.S. bases today, more than 1,000 U.S. bases all over the world. We're the center of an empire right here. And the fascists that they maintain who are outside screaming and yelling and with their flags and with their insignia and they want to disrupt the meeting, we're not going to allow it to be disrupted. 
we're going to go forward because it's an anti-war movement that is determined, that has our feet on the ground, that is what's really needed. This is the foulest thing I've, I've ever seen. I think this is as an ascension to power by fascistic minded forces. This almost makes Mussolini's march on Rome and Hitler being becoming chancellor of Germany look civilized by comparison. It is that ugly, it is that foul, and it is that dangerous. A couple things we should keep in mind. This is the 100th anniversary of the beginning of World War I, the war to end all wars, the war to make the world safe for democracy. It is also the 75th anniversary of the beginning of World War II with Hitler's invasion of Poland and the deaths of 50 million people. We have to put these matters into perspective. Five years ago, on the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, which of course was a great media event in the West because it was uh, an orgy of triumphalism, but all Western democratic values had progressed, uh, had dominated the world. Uh, a Russian commentator said, the Berlin Wall may have been dismantled, it's simply been re uh, erected again along the entire Western border of Russia, and that in fact is the case. And it's another anniversary this year, it's the 10th anniversary of the largest expansion of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in its history, whereas one of the previous speakers uh, you know, uh, indicated uh, seven new members were brought in, all of them in Eastern Europe, three of them former Soviet republics, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Immediately upon those three Baltic states being brought into NATO, NATO began a series of regular air patrols with warplanes out of Lithuania. Uh, this has been going on for a decade. A Russian commentator, a uh, political figure, mentioned at the time that these planes are a five-minute flight from the second largest city in Russia, St. Petersburg, and not a tremendously longer flight from the capital of Russia, Moscow. I can only imagine if, a, if a, another country were to station warplanes within striking distance of New York and Washington, D.C., what the reaction would be in the American media as well as amongst the American government. But this is what's been steadily mounting, inexorably mounting, for the last 15 years since, uh, three things occurred simultaneously. This is in uh, the spring of 1999. To celebrate the, uh, you know, the ascension to power of what uh, President Obama remarked on the occasion of receiving his Nobel Peace Prize yet, uh, identified the United States as, in his words, the world's sole military superpower. That term should send chills down your back. That anything like that could exist at all, much less that the person who identifies himself, and incidentally in that same speech, as the commander in chief of that world sole military superpower, boast of it, you know, should have been a wake up call to the world. Uh, Fifteen years ago, three things happened simultaneously. The first ever NATO summit was held in the, the first NATO summit ever to be held in the United States occurred in Washington, D.C. To, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of a military bloc that was created ostensibly to defend itself against the Soviet Union, which at that time had not existed for eight years. It also marked the first absorption of former Warsaw Pact countries into the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland. Yet also, uh, NATO now, not having to worry about a Soviet Union or any other military power that could defend itself, uh, launched a blistering 78-day uh, unprovoked air war against a sovereign nation, Yugoslavia. You know, when I see uh, fascist thugs running through the capital city of a European country, it's evocative of seeing a European capital, Belgrade, in flames being bombed for the first time since Hitler's Blitzkrieg Wars. I'm basically just going to lay out what the anti-war position is that our committee has taken. Um, the anti-war movement needs to take a firm stand against all forms of U.S. military and political intervention. And the recent events in Ukraine are just one more example of an imperialist U.S. foreign policy which seeks to destabilize and subjugate sovereign nations in a relentless drive for profit and power. So, the Anti-War Committee of Chicago is taking a stance of no U.S. intervention, no U.S.-backed fascists, no sanctions on Russia, and money for jobs, health care, and education at home. Um, despite the Cooperation Act signed by Clinton and Yeltsin in 1997, NATO has expanded into Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, Latvia, Lithu Lithuania, and uh, other former Soviet states. Um, NATO was formed as a Cold War alliance. And we need to reject the continuation of these Cold War policies and politics, ramping up the tensions with Russia. So no U.S.-backed fascists. Uh, as we've seen in Chile, Venezuela, Honduras, the U.S. has absolutely no qualms about allying with fascist and extreme right forces. The Maidan protests were led by 
right-wing nationalist Svoboda Party, and they gained their violent momentum from the fascist paramilitary the right sector. The U.S. media has been this whole time kind of denying, downplaying the fascist influence, and even some supposedly left anti-imperialist groups have supported the Maidan protests. Uh, it's no coincidence now that fascists are in positions of power in the new government. Uh, Svoboda has a quarter of Ukraine's ministries, which is more than any other right-wing party on the continent. And the right sector is ostensibly in control of uh, Kiev's security forces. So giving free reign to fascists and ultranationalists who have targeted Russian speakers and ethnic minorities and vandalized World War II memorials threatens the very democracy that the U.S. is trying to supposedly promote in Ukraine. Inside the U.S., even though it's the largest prison population in the world and the largest police force in most cities, much larger than the military of most countries, there's still a democratic form, right? We're able to organize this meeting. But we have to be aware of what we're up against. And unless we, in a determined way, organize a movement that stands against all U.S. wars and links it to the disastrous, deteriorating conditions right here. In New York City today, I'm from New York, so I'll give the figures from there. I'm sure there are many folks here who could give the Chicago figures. One in five people, one in five, 20 percent, rely on food pantries and soup kitchens in order to eat. So the final slogan, money for jobs, health care, and education here at home. John Kerry recently visited Ukraine and announced a one billion aid package to prop up the new government. Uh, why is the government spending billions to support an openly fascist government when we have millions of unemployed and underemployed uh, people here in the U.S. when 15 percent of adults still lack health insurance and states are cutting pensions, they're closing schools, they're privatizing public services. You know, they always say, oh, there's no money for the things that we need here, but there's always money for another war, right? So my conclusion is that we need a strong, militant anti-war movement to take a stand against this imperialist foreign policy, which destroy the lives of citizens abroad and at home. Now, U.S. imperialism is absolutely arrogant, and they always overestimate their own power. There was nothing to oppose them rolling into Iraq. Nothing at all. Iraq had no military at all. Not one anti-aircraft missile left. But they never thought there would be an Iraqi resistance that made it impossible for them to stay. We want to look at what is happening in the Ukraine and what happened when the U.S. simply thought they could seize hold of the largest Russian naval base, which is in the Crimea, which is there legally and by treaty. But if Ukraine joined NATO and joined the EU, signed the association agreement, the very next step was to uh, force Russia out of a naval base where they've been for about 238 years, the largest base U.S. imperialism had already counted that as theirs. And they were outraged, outraged that the people of the Crimea first stood up and said no. And they knew the day, the day that the Kiev junta, the day that that Kiev coup did away with autonomy that had always existed in, in Crimea these past years, did away with autonomy, what it would mean and what the next step was. So they refused. Russia secured its base. There was an overwhelming vote to ally with Russia. Now, that's an important step because it's the first time, it's the first time NATO has been stopped. It's a dangerous step. The civil war that's coming may be extremely bloody. The U.S. made every kind of threat They've sent aircraft carriers. They've sent destroyers into the Black Sea. They've moved troops into location. There's actually a struggle going on right now, even within the Pentagon, who want to take, some of them want to take military action, and others are saying, you know, Russia is not Iraq or Libya. They have nuclear weapons. 
Now, the Soviet Empire. I mention that term because it's very much in the news now. I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room who in recent weeks has seen comments in mainstream U.S. corporate media, uh, such as the Russian Red Army has moved into Crimea, <laughs> into the Soviet Republic of Crimea. I d this is true. Uh, they are either trying to evoke Cold War nightmarish images, or they're intentionally uh, distorting this, or they have not grown out of their own Cold War mindset to any degree so they can still use outdated terminology like that. But I want, also want to thank all of our speakers. I feel like each is contributing to a greater understanding and clarity as to what our target should be in order to create a successful movement opposing fascism in Ukraine, the U.S. government and the strong arm, strong arm of its policies, NATO. 75% of NATO's defense spending comes from the U.S. defense budget. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Anti-War Committee Chicago, which both myself and Holly are a part of. We came together after the 15,000-person march against NATO. This march was a shot of adrenaline for the anti-war movement, which had previously been in a lull. People came together to oppose NATO not only because of its long list of atrocities, but also because many see how it colludes with the U.S. government and perpetuates a system of profits before people and war and occupation before human needs. Many of the people I spoke with at the NATO protest who were from the U.S. felt it was their duty and their right to challenge NATO, as so much of what they do is justified as being in our interest. Yet I think it is clear to all of us that it is not in our interest, but in the interest of the 1% and the bloodthirsty corporations that profit off of war. One of these corporations has its headquarters in our own city, Boeing, the number two weapons manufacturer in the U.S. The Anti-War Committee started its campaign against Boeing when we took the lead role in planning the march to commemorate the 11th anniversary of the invasion of Afghanistan. Afghanistan is one of the countries that has been heavily traumatized by drone use. Currently, Boeing makes drones that are used to threaten and carry out assassinations, but is also competing to create the next combat drone prototype. Losing this Navy contract would be a major blow to Boeing, but a major gain to all who demand an end to the military-industrial complex. The campaign against Boeing also directly links to the demand of money for jobs, education, health care, and not for war. In their arrogance, U.S. imperialism always underestimates the mass mood, what the workers themselves do when they come into action. And that's what we're seeing in the Ukraine in the last few weeks, that in response to this coup in the Ukraine, the workers themselves have stood up throughout eastern and southern and southeast Ukraine. In city after city, there have been, they call it people's assemblies, and it's not just a quiet assembly. They've gone in and seized the government buildings and built lines of defense. And then the Kiev fascists have sent mercenaries, some of them right from Blackwater, I'm sorry, now called Greystone, uh, same mercenary forces. And other fascist forces, they've distributed guns to the fascists, but they have not yet been able to stop this mass movement. And the mass movement is making very different demands, maybe even than Russia expected. They're saying, let's renationalize. Let's do away with this privatization. Let's charge these oligarchs. Now, yesterday, there was a very important meeting. The US guy, I say call him Yachts, he gave a deadline that the forces, the people's forces that have seized government buildings must clear them immediately. Otherwise, the military will move in. And you know what happened? The military refused to take action. They refused to fire on the workers' movement. So he went there and said, and they were demanding that there be a referendum on autonomy, or on the relationship to Russia, and the continued relationship to, to the Kiev fascists. And he actually went there and said, oh, well, maybe there should be autonomy. Maybe there should be a referendum, which is scheduled for May 11th. So things are going to be heating up in this next month. We should be aware of that. This call for a referendum is really a, a latent, a new, a young form of people's power. 
and it's being fought out on many levels in a united form in some ways when you see the images and there's Russian flags and there's red flags and there's communist forces and Russian nationalist forces and it's kind of a mixed bag and it is also with the demands but there's a lot that's breaking loose that is a big showdown for US imperialism what did they take on here People came together to oppose NATO not only because of its long list of atrocities, but also because many see how it colludes with the U.S. government and perpetuates a system of profits before people and war and occupation before human needs. 